When one follows the politics of contemporary Europe, he can't not notice that there is a wide ideological gap in the middle of the old continent. This divide was always there, but it did not really emerge as an important factor within European politics until the migration crisis of 2015. The 2015 European migrant crisis, also known internationally as the Syrian refugee crisis, was a period of significantly increased movement of refugees and migrants into Europe in 2015, when 1.3 million people came to the continent to request asylum, the most in a single year since World War II. Those requesting asylum in Europe in 2015 were mostly Syrians, but also included significant numbers of Afghans, Nigerians, Pakistanis, Iraqis and Eritreans. It was in response to this large inflow of people that we might for the first time see in a plain sight that the publics and politicians on the opposite sides of the former Iron Curtain do not just disagree on the causes, effects and solutions to this issue, but also flat out do not understand each other's views and opinions. Since this event, it has become clear that the differences in the perception of certain societal and political issues on the different sides of the former Iron Curtain are indeed very significant and that it has a potential to be a long-term factor in the development of the European politics. We can observe these ideological disagreements glimmer through to the surface during the last couple of years, connecting as a threat several political conflicts that are festering within the European Union. Currently, the most visible symptom of this divide is the ongoing, more or less open battle between the law and justice rule government of Poland and the Fidesz rule government of Hungary and the European Union institutions. This conflict is presented as a battle to save liberal democracy, rule of law and to protect the allocation of EU funds by one side and as an ideological imperialistic crusade to punish conservative governments by the other side. Without getting into the institutional and legal details of this conflict, and without passing the judgments about which side is closer to the truth, since it would be out of the scope of this video, it is hard to deny that there certainly is an ideological aspect to the EU pressure on these two governments. I would say that no one who is following EU politics can honestly say that the nationally conservative ideological roots of Fidesz and law and justice's governments does not influence the approach of the EU institutions and the Western European publics and establishments. In other words, if governments with at least declaratory more liberal and pro-EU views would try to implement the judicial reforms that Poland is under pressure for, the reaction of the EU establishment would be nowhere near as resolute and aggressive as it is. And if at least declaratorily more liberal and pro-EU government would be accused of limiting the press freedom and large-scale corruption, as in Hungary, the reaction of the EU would, once again, be significantly milder, if any. There are countries with huge corruption issues in the EU, for example Romania and Bulgaria, but they are not receiving even a fraction of the negative attention that Viktor Orban gets. The ideological differences between different parts of Europe already affect the inner workings of the European Union and the whole continent. I would say that the most divisive subjects are LGBT rights, the legitimacy of the desire to sustain the ethnic and cultural homogeneity of a country in the face of large-scale immigration and connected issues often dealing with various pushes for broadly understood anti-racism, environmentalism, the role of a nation-state vis-a-vis the European Union, the women's rights and more broadly defined gender roles, the view of American involvement in the European security system and technocratic leadership versus democratic, even if populist leadership. On these issues, there is usually a very significant breaking point in public opinions once one crosses the border between Germany and Austria on the western side and Poland, Czechia, Slovakia and Hungary on the eastern side. It is fair to acknowledge that countries on both sides of the former Cold War Iron Curtain are far from being an ideological monolith. There are profound differences between countries like Sweden and Italy, with the general rule of a thumb being that historically Catholic countries, like the aforementioned Italy, are less susceptible to general social progressivism, while the historically protestant countries, like the aforementioned Sweden, are usually on the forefront of it. And similarly, there are countries that are significantly more socially conservative, like Poland, than others, like Slovenia, in the formerly communist part of Europe. But there are some indicators that clearly shows some broader differences between Western and Central and Eastern Europe. When we examine the legality of the same-sex marriage, we can see that while in the parts of Europe that were not part of the Eastern Bloc, it is basically a standard, with only country where the same-sex marriage is not legal being Italy. In the formerly communist countries, it is the exact opposite, with only one country, Slovenia, having legalized the same-sex marriage. 
I already mentioned the different reaction to mass immigration from the Muslim countries in 2015, and there are plenty of other examples. But if I had to mention one single event that made me think about these issues the most, it would be the incident that happened during the European League football match between Slavia Prague and Glasgow Rangers in the March of 2021. Most people probably do not know anything about this, because it really isn't that important unless you are a football fan and you support some of the clubs involved. So. I will try to briefly describe the situation and why it brought me to thinking about this topic. In the end of a very intense football match between Glasgow Rangers and Slavia Prague, which was from the beginning played very roughly and aggressively from the Rangers side, which committed some pretty ugly fouls. In one of those fouls, Slavia goalkeeper got his school fractured. Czech player Andrzej Kudela came up to the black player of Rangers and said something to his ear, with his mouth covered with hand. The player, Glenn Kamara, accused Kudela of racism and of saying to him, you are f word monkey, you know you are. Kudela denied it and accused Kamara of physically attacking him inside the stadium after the match. A couple of weeks afterwards, the punishment was given by the UEFA. 10 match ban for Kudela, 4 match ban for the player that fractured the skull of a goalkeeper and 3 match ban for Kamara for the attack inside the stadium. Now why am I talking about this irrelevant football skirmish? Because I find the differences in the reactions of Czech society and British society to that incident to be really fascinating. After the verdict was given, Czech society was almost unanimously united in seeing the punishment as unfair, unreasonable and just outrageous. From our conservative president Miloš Zeman, across the political spectrum all the way to the representatives of the Pirate Party, which is really the closest thing in Czech parliament to the western-style progressive left. Everybody condemned the punishment. The main arguments you can hear from everyone. Basically, how can UEFA punish the player for something they did not prove he did? And if they do punish him, how can they give substantially higher punishment for verbal offense than for two physical attacks? Another thing that was often pointed out was the fact that the UK press did not at all talk about the dangerous and aggressive behavior of Glasgow players, despite it being crucial for the context of the whole thing, and all the attention was aimed at the alleged racism. Generally, everybody here will agree that it is a complete farce and it has nothing to do with justice. Then I looked at some forums like Reddit, Facebook discussions on UK sport-related pages or British press and I was stunned. 99% of the comments were outraged too, but for completely opposite reasons. Everybody was complaining about the punishment being too light, that the player should have been banned for several years or for life or that the whole club should have been abolished from the UEFA tournaments and that the fact that Kamara was punished for only reacting, even if violently, to a racist offence is unacceptable. There was also a lot of talks about criminal charges against the Czech player from Scottish police and talks of prison time. These comments basically sum up how the UK public opinion seems to look at this issue. How it is possible that two groups of people look at identical thing with the identical set of information and comes to an opposite conclusions. All these people in the UK are not some raging progressive leftists or die-hard Rangers fans and over 90% of Czechs aren't some overt racist assholes. There are much deeper societal forces in play here. So the main question this video is trying to answer is why? Why are there such critical differences between different parts of Europe and why these differences overlap so neatly with the former Cold War West-East divide? Now. The obvious answer to this question is that it is because of communism, right? But I believe that while communism certainly plays a role in this story, we need to go even deeper back in time to fully understand these differences. Specifically, we need to go to the times when the modern sense of national consciousness was being awakened in Europe. It is the year 780 and the Emperor Joseph II rules the Austrian Empire. He was an emperor in the era of the so-called enlightened absolutism which basically means that the rulers of the time thought of themselves as the heralds of societal progress influenced by the faults of enlightenment realized through absolutist rule. Joseph II did some enlightened reforms, most notably the abolishment of serfdom, although later partially rolled back in parts of the empire. But he was also fascinated by the Western European empires of France and Great Britain and wanted to emulate their success. One of the very stark contrasts between these two states and the Austrian Empire was the comparatively very high level of ethnic and language homogeneity in France and Great Britain. Austrian Empire, on the other hand, could have hardly been more diverse. German, Hungarian, Czech, Slovak, Polish, Ruthenian, Slovene, Croatian, Serbian, Romanian, Lombard, 
Latin, Italian, Ukrainian and Yiddish. All those languages were spoken by the inhabitants of the empire. So, it was hard to imagine this big, multicultural amalgam of peoples to be transformed into highly centralized entity resembling a modern nation-state. But nonetheless, Joseph still attempted to make this transformation happen. Reforms were passed that made the use of the German language compulsory, replacing Latin or, in some instances, local languages. As it often is in history, These reforms brought unexpected and unwanted results that were mostly the opposite of Joseph's wishes. Among many members of the Hungarian lesser nobility, it sparked fears of cultural imperialism and Germanization of the Hungarian culture. This process was to a certain extent already taking place, with many members of Hungarian upper nobility already being Germanized and the German language increasingly replacing Hungarian among the upper classes and the urban folk. This process was even more developed in the lands of the Bohemian crown, so, in the other words, contemporary Czechia. In the course of the 18th century, the Czech language was being increasingly replaced by the German language among nobility, urban folk and the elites of the land. Czech was becoming the language of peasants and village folk, and contemporary major Czech cities like Prague and Brno were basically German cities back then. Joseph's vision of further Germanization sparked a profound anxiety among the ever-decreasing number of educated Czechs with developed national awareness, anxiety of slow but sure cultural extinction, and they started to push back. It sparked processes of so-called national revivals among Czechs and Hungarians. Cultural movements which took place in the Czech and Hungarian lands during the 18th and 19th century. The purpose of these movements was to revive the Czech and Hungarian languages, cultures and national identities. I believe that acknowledging this feeling of cultural anxiety and fear of your culture being most often represented by the national language slowly fading away and being replaced by some other, more dominant language that is usually also forcefully politically pushed by the imperial state your nation is living under, is crucial to understand the later societal and political development of this part of Europe. It is a pattern that can be found all over the broader region. While Czechs and Hungarians face Germanization, Hungarians also try to reproduce these efforts to create a more homogenized nation-state by suppressing the many nations living under Hungarian rule within the Hungarian kingdom, with their own efforts of Magyarization. This included, among others, Romanians, Croats and Slovaks. And the whole cycle repeated itself, since the efforts to Magyarize the non-Hungarian peoples led to them experiencing their own national revivals. Poland was being partitioned between Prussia, Russia and Austria in the second half of the 18th century, and Poles had to endure severe pressures of both Russification and Germanization. But, as with the Czechs, Hungarians and other nations in the Habsburg Empire, Polish national identity was most likely strengthened by this struggle, not weakened. It shows that when people see their culture slip away, their language and history not being taught in schools, their literature not being published and their voices being suppressed, it usually does not lead to them giving up and surrender, but on the contrary, they dig in, their identity becomes even more entrenched and they fight back. Thus. The birth of modern national identities of many countries in the region was shaped by the defensive mentality of endangered peoples. When you look at the map of Europe in the years 1795 to 1877, so from the third partition of Poland till the independence of Romania, you will notice that none of the nations that occupies the space between Germany, Russia and Turkey had their own state. When the modern brew of nationalism swept over Europe from the west to the east, most of this region was basically colonized by strong imperial states around them. This period is very deeply ingrained in the collective national memories of the nations of Central and Eastern Europe. We can start drawing some conclusions regarding the current times here. When you look at the reluctance of Central and Eastern European countries for deeper and deeper European integration, and eventual federalization, it starts here. It is often seen as just another attempt to subjugate these countries under foreign, most notably German, rule. It is a region that in its modern history was pretty much always gravely endangered by forces surrounding it. And I believe that it tilted the societies of these nations more towards the values of self-preservation than towards the values of self-expression. This is clearly visible on the various cultural maps where nations of Central and Eastern Europe like Poland, Czech Republic, Hungary, Baltic States or Slovakia stand close to East Asian countries like Japan or Taiwan, Southeast Asian countries like Thailand or Vietnam or the State of Israel, at least on the self-preservation versus self-expression axis. In stark contrast to that, we can see that the cluster of Protestant European countries and the Anglosphere countries being pretty much isolated on the self-expression end of the spectrum. In this sense, Countries of Central and Eastern Europe 
are more similar to the rest of the world than to the rest of the Western civilization. After the World War I, all of the powers that held power over the region collapsed. The fall of Austria-Hungary, Ottoman Empire, Russian Empire and the German Empire allowed the unprecedented rise of new states in the region. Czechoslovakia, Poland, Baltic states, Hungary and the Kingdom of Yugoslavia. The interwar period is often seen as a golden period, for example in Poland and the Czech Republic, mostly because these nations finally got their own statehood. But this period was also a massive mess. Almost all of the newly created countries led at least one war against pretty much all of their neighbors. The states had plenty of internal and external problems and as the power of both the Nazi Germany and the Soviet Union rose, it was increasingly obvious that it won't last. But it is important to note that a lot of these newly created states, we can again use the example of Poland and the Czechoslovakia, struggled with ethnic minorities living within the state they did not identify with, since the states were clearly run as nation states and often even worked to undermine it. This was caused by the ethnic composition and distribution of peoples across the Central and Eastern Europe. When you look at the ethnic map of Europe at the time, you will see that while Western Europe was more or less neatly ethnically divided, which made creation of nation states much easier, to the east from Germany it was kind of a mess. It made creation of nation states a zero-sum game, where for one nation to succeed and have their state often meant for some other peoples to lose and be stuck within a state they did not really want to be a part of. Sudeten Germans in Czechoslovakia, Hungarians in Czechoslovakia and Romania Ukrainians and Lithuanians in Poland, Germans in Poland, the list goes on. We can again draw some conclusions from this, this time regarding the large scales immigration from Africa and the Middle East. When you consider the cultural insecurity caused by millenniums of imperial rule and attempts to diminish the relevance of your language in combination with memories of often disharmonious cohabitation with ethnic minorities that did not share the allegiance to the state that the main ethnic group did. It is not hard to see why populations of these countries might see the influx of people from vastly different cultures as a threat to their cultures. The fact that the troubles with assimilation of these people in the Western Europe are clearly visible of course also adds up to this. Then came the World War II which transformed Eastern Europe into an absolute hellscape. It was a complete mayhem full of genocide, war crimes and two totalitarian regimes rolling over the region. Many people do not realize this, but estimates show that over half of the old victims of the World War II were coming from the region of Central and Eastern Europe. More people died during the World War II in Yugoslavia, a country that many people in the West do not even connect to the World War II that much, than in the UK and France combined. It was really one of the most horrific episodes in history. And if in the previous decades and centuries, nations of this region were afraid of being slowly culturally replaced, during the Second World War, the Nazis turned this into straight up physical annihilation based on an ethnicity. While the Nazi ideology was very inconsistent and it mattered a lot if your nation was living on the land the Nazis chosen to be their Lebensraum, nations were looking at several levels of potential disintegration. Majority of Poles, Ukrainians, Russians and Belarusians were deemed racially completely unworthy and they also lived on the land central to Hitler's colonial vision. So they were to be partially exterminated, partially enslaved and partially expelled to Siberia beyond the Ural Mountains. Czechs were deemed a little more racially viable and thus bigger part of the nation should have been Germanized. But even here, a substantial part of the Czech nation was also identified as racially unworthy and set to extermination or abolishment. The nations living on lands not seen as crucial for the expansion of the German nation were usually treated as factual client states or colonies, but it was presented as if they were allies. This includes Slovakia, Hungary, Croatia, Bulgaria or Romania. These countries usually had some agenda of their own that they believed will be better achieved under the wings of Germany or just really did not have much other options than to become German ally slash client state slash colony. The regimes in these countries varied from authoritarian with certain fascist leanings, for example in Hungary, to straight up hardcore fascist, racist, murderous regime, for example in Croatia. There was a remarkable difference between how the Nazis saw nations to the north and west of their borders and to the east. States like France, Denmark, Norway or the Netherlands were to be subjugated but all these nations were seen as worthy enough to exist and to have their own statehood even if with limited levels of freedom. They were seen as natural parts of the European order and even Hitler did not really imagine a world without the French or the Dutch. But it got very different on the eastern border. Poles, 
Czechs or Ukrainians, and indeed the Jewish nation, were perceived as not only undeserving of their own states, but not even worthy enough to physically exist in this perverse racial utopia the Nazis dreamed of. The collective societal long-term reactions to the Second World War also differ significantly on the opposite sides of the former Iron Curtain. The Israeli writer Yoram Hazoni, in his book The Virtue of Nationalism, present a thesis that Western Europe basically collectively concluded that the horrors of the World War II were direct outcome of nationalism. And thus, the only way of stopping such horror from happening again is to stop nationalism as a concept. It basically said, we have to change society in such a way that it won't be able to do such things again. But different countries took different messages. When you look at the nations that actually suffered the most, they never believed such concepts. It is partially because of the fact that while Nazi imperialism was fused with incredibly cranked up racial nationalism, it was just other nationalisms that beat Nazis back. People weren't fighting for human rights, democracy or rule of law. People are willing to go and die in protection of their loved ones and because of nationalism. English, Polish, Russian or American. So, it is very simplistic to say that to give up nationalism is the right way to not let genocide happen again. Without nationalism, there would not be nor Nazis nor their opponents. So, it is a complex issue. Nationalism can breathe both good and bad, as can every other major political ideology. Western Europe mostly arrived at very administrative understanding of what a nation is. State is just a neutral arbiter that grants rights and freedoms to individual peoples living in its administrative borders. There is not much thought given to a concept of nation as a whole body and its national interest conceived as something else than just a sum of individual rights and economic interests of its citizens. Cultural and ethnic considerations are considered out of place in a majority of contemporary Western Europe. Nationalism is considered an ugly word and love for your nation is better expressed as a love for your state, its laws, institutions and bureaucratic apparatus. First and foremost, it is important not to make any cultural qualitative judgments. Cultures are different, but equal. To assess different cultures qualitatively by their success, which is something that one cannot really avoid when honestly looking at the world, is just a step away from assessing ethnicities qualitatively, which reeks of racism, the capital crime of our times. And racism led to racially defined nation and extreme German nationalism that caused the biggest genocide in the history of the world. Now, as I said before, not all countries reacted by the described ideological development. The best example is the Jewish nation. While Germans, the perpetrators of most of the crimes, choose to give up the ability to do such abhorrent deeds ever again, Jews went in exactly the opposite way. They knew that people will never really change, and that the right way to react is to have a nation state for the Jewish nation that will be so strong and capable that nobody will ever have another opportunity to hurt their people again. And when you look at the state of Israel, it is very much an antidote of modern Western Europe. It is a deeply religious, nationalistic and militaristic nation-state, and I definitely do not see any of those adjectives as an insult. While the Western Europe is in the midst of an ongoing process of building a supranational, secular and pacifistic entity, Israel is also incredibly successful. Now, I believe that majority of Eastern European nations took a lesson more similar to that of Israel and less similar to that of Germany, which is the basic root of many of the political East-West divisions within the EU. After the World War II, the continent became also formally divided by the Iron Curtain that separated the Western capitalist democracies from the Eastern communist dictatorships. In a way, this was just another chapter in a long line of foreign imperial subjugations of the region's nations, this time in especially perverse ideological shape. But the communist period is also absolutely crucial to understanding the present reluctance to wokeness in the region. And to understand the East, we have to again also look to the West. After the World War II, the birth rates skyrocketed in most Western countries. USA were on the forefront of this process. But UK, Germany, Italy or France all have their baby boomers. Now, these very numerous generations started becoming teenagers in the 1960s and their presence 
together with post-World War II economic miracle in countries like USA, Italy or Germany led to a very specific situation. Loads of young people with incredibly high living standards compared to anything that humanity experienced ever before. This led to a cultural big bang, youth culture, rock and roll, LSD, hippies, civil rights, anti-war movement, all of that. As the time passed, the generations of 1960s Western free-thinking youth were getting older, richer and more influential. While the spontaneous movements of the 1960s were gone, the participants continued to live their lives and working on their careers. And as they moved through the ranks of academia, corporations, newspapers, cultural and political institutions, they all carried with them the good fight of their youth. It basically became the standard among certain circles to be progressive, liberal, anti-traditionalist. Behind Iron Curtain, the world was different. The sweet set of circumstances that allowed the Western Cultural Revolution to happen just was not present in the East. The people in the East were rebuilding their countries after the war in the name of Marx-Leninism and the dictatorship of the proletariat. But maybe more importantly, they were the satellites and buffer zones of the USSR, which by that time basically transformed into the continuation of old Russian imperialism on Bolshevik steroids. So, their revolutions, or more accurately, the attempts, were not cultural, but national. Basically, it was more of the same for the peoples in the region, trying to get some space for their nations under the jurisdiction of another empire. Church was not a form of age-old oppression to revolt against. It was one of the good guys, since it was mostly banned by communists. Utopian dreams of life without countries, heaven or possessions to borrow lyrics from one of the most iconic songs of the time by John Lennon, were not really that attractive for the populations there. People wanted their countries, they wanted their God, and they wanted some possessions. People in the Eastern Bloc were also dreaming about and idealizing the West. But for them, the West meant basically the possibility to have their own nation states with their predominant cultures without being under the wings of some huge imperial power and possibly to also have democracy, basic freedoms and higher living standards. They weren't thinking about LGBT rights, racism or smashing the patriarchy when thinking about the West. They were thinking about BMWs, the ability to own stuff, freedom of press, being able to be openly Christian, being able to kick the Russians out of their countries, traveling out of the country or listening to Western rock music openly. And then they more or less got all that, but they also discovered that the West they dreamed about kind of changed while they were shut off. As we mentioned earlier, the cultural revolution of the 1960s that culminated during the 1968 youth and student protests all over the Western world started the so-called Long March Through the Institutions. The Long March Through the Institutions is a slogan coined by a communist student activist Rudy Duczke around 1967 to describe his strategy for establishing the conditions for a revolution, subverting society by infiltrating institutions such as the professions. The phrase Long March is a reference to the prolonged struggle of the Chinese communists which included a physical long march of their army across China. I cannot help but think that this aim was eventually incredibly successful. That is why different facets of progressive ideologies became so incredibly overrepresented among the opinion-making institutions throughout the Western world. During the decades after the 1960s, the young revolutionaries of the 1968 became prominent among the academia, media, and the cultural institutions. Now, there are many terms that people use to describe the ideology that these young people adhere to. And it is of course true that it is impossible to lump them all under one roof, since they inevitably believed many different things. But most often we can come across terms like neo-Marxism, cultural Marxism, social progressivism, or postmodernism. Now, it is very easy to get into long and futile debates about the precise meaning of these terms with people that are using their superior knowledge of philosophy and sociology to disqualify usage of these terms, arguing that people using them do not really know what they mean and thus their usage is incorrect. But it does not really matter. These terms just do represent certain political thoughts. They are held by people on the left of the political spectrum and people using them know very well what they mean by them. 
If I had to come up with one unifying team that is connecting all of these movements and ideas, it would probably be the practice of viewing almost every societal norm, relationship, institution and tradition through lenses of power structures and oppression, state, religion, nation, family, traditional gender roles, capitalism or biological sex are all, in some way or the other, forms of either deliberate or unconscious means of oppression of ever-increasing number of various minorities and the liberation of these minorities from these oppressive structures is the goal that political and activist efforts should work to achieve. And sure, you can argue that there is some truth to most of these claims. To accept some identity as a male or a female, member of a church, member of a nation or any group with some traditional established patterns of behavior is to a certain extent restrictive and thus can be considered oppressive in a very extensive interpretation of the word. In the end, the most important difference in the worldview between progressives and those who oppose them lies in the answer to a question if those restrictive patterns of behavior are inherently bad and oppressive or if they are inherently good and elemental to the survival of a society. It does not seem to be a coincidence that the societies that tilt towards self-expression tend to choose the former and the societies that tilt toward self-preservation tend to choose the latter. There is also relatively strong correlation between countries that are geopolitically threatened by dangerous geopolitical forces being closer to self-preservation values and those that are existing in a more secure geographic location being closer to self-expression values. Sure, correlation does not equal causation, and therefore sure are other societal forces in play. The differences between Protestant and Catholic societies, and also between broader Western Christianity and Orthodox Eastern Church, are also very important, and we could find countless other examples. But when one honestly studies the history of the region of Central and Eastern Europe, It becomes clear that the constant pressure made these nations much more appreciative of many concepts that might be often seen as obsolete in the West. Eastern European nations mostly still see a nation-state as an elemental basis of their existence in the international environment. The vision of pan-European entity under German and French leadership is not an appealing one for majority of people in post-communist Europe. Their history is too full of suppression and imperial conquest to now give up their sovereignty so easily. Now to have a functioning nation-state you need a nation. Nation that is somehow defined and that definition can be both positive and negative. By that I mean that you can define it both by who is a member and who is not. It is completely acceptable to argue for maintaining certain level of ethnic and cultural homogeneity in Eastern Europe. Most people see that as normal and logical. That of course does not mean that people of different ethnicities cannot integrate into the nation. There are ethnic minorities in every Eastern European country and many states in the region like Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia or Hungary are now net immigration countries. There are both numerous European immigrant populations like Ukrainians and non-European immigrant populations like the Vietnamese. But it is a sovereign right of any nation to choose who in what numbers and in what pace they will let live in their country. Sure, every nation is a social and philosophical construct of a kind. People can have fluent identities and it is easy to break up any claim of ethnic coherency by genetic haplogroup researchers and such. But it is a construct that proved incredibly successful, inspiring and functional. People have been willing to die for this abstract concept for centuries. And if you need a population that might be willing to do so also in the future, you need to keep this flame alive. If a certain religion has been a hallmark of your national identity for centuries, it is good to try to protect it. You also need other stinky concepts for example, traditional gender roles. Look at the war in Ukraine. The situation there is crystal clear. Almost all the women and children should flee or be protected, and all the able-bodied men should fight and are prohibited from leaving the state. When you listen to journalists that are reporting from Ukraine, they will say to you, 
The Ukrainians are not fighting for human rights, democracy or inclusivity. They are fighting and dying for their nation. The question is, would contemporary populations of many Western European countries be willing to do so? How would the numerous ethnic minorities behave? Would Kurds in Sweden, Turks in Germany or Algerians in France be willing to mobilize in large numbers and defend their new homelands? Do they feel the deep, almost spiritual connection to their homeland and nation? I do not know. We will probably find out in the future. Nations that want to survive need to stay in contact with the primal and barbaric side of humanity, at least a little bit. They need men willing to kill and die for them. Would anyone kill and die for the European Union or the rule of law? You need to harness that feeling that makes you scream as a lunatic when your national football or hockey team scores. Of course, you need not to go overboard with that, which can be hard. To somehow summarize these thoughts, I would say that the nations of Central and Eastern Europe are more resentful toward concepts and ideas that they perceive, rightfully or not, as weakening the ability of a nation to wage war and to biologically reproduce. Majority of population of Central and Eastern Europe still remembers foreign suppression or occupation. They remember that the world is a hard and dangerous place and it can crush you if you aren't ready. And lot of the concepts that Western Europe largely deemed as obsolete are not just helpful, but even necessary in some kind of security crisis. Things like the traditional gender roles, a healthy dose of nationalism and even some level of cultural chauvinism up to a point are crucial. If you need your population to potentially engage in large-scale military conflict in the name of a national survival. The liberation of women and the fight against the traditional gender role within society, which has usually been motherhood, can be perceived as a threat to a nation's ability to reproduce, since all the women just chase careers and won't settle down to have kids, so to speak. When people see the result of fight for the rights of LGBT plus people, For example, the fact that a recent study showed that the number of LGBT plus self-identified people among young Americans rose threefold to 21% in the last 10 years, and that the trans and non-binary identification rose by some 1000%. It checks both boxes, the ability to biologically reproduce and the ability to wage war to defend itself. An issue that would deserve a big video on its own is Western European obsession with bringing down CO2 emissions and thus stop or slow down climate change. Whether we agree with the belief that the climate change is primarily a man-made issue, it is hard to deny that the attempts to massively shift to renewable energy, even if it means sacrificing energy security, living standards of Europeans and potentially even possibility to continue as an industrial society, while all the other major polluters continue to massively pollute, are borderline insane. But it's also one of the dogmatic views of the current European establishment. If we had to find an oppressor and the victim in this relationship, it would probably be the fact that people, especially the rich people in the developed world, are oppressing the earth itself with their emission-intensive ways. They should either excessively stop consuming and thus give up the civilized industrial way of life or stop reproducing completely and just make way for fauna and flora to reclaim the earth. Those beliefs are also much harder to sell to ex-Eastern Bloc populations, which still give clear preference to energy security and economic growth over abstract dreams about saving the planet for future generations, especially if those generations are made up of someone else's kids since Europeans suffering from climate anxiety are reluctant to have some anyway. The title of this video is Why is Central and Eastern Europe not woke? And I am aware that it is a certain oversimplification. There are people that upheld progressivist ideology present in these countries and they are also hugely overrepresented among media, academia and the cultural sphere. In my home country of the Czech Republic and likely in most of the other countries in the region, There are culture wars happening all the time and the populations are divided on many subjects. Usually there is an issue that is often unnecessarily imported from the Western discourse but can also be homegrown. That is dividing the population and the majority of the people is having a different opinion than most of the opinion-making classes. That is not something special 
as it is happening all over the Western world. Nonetheless, the progressivist worldview is still much less rooted in among the populations and the elites alike. There is still much larger diversity of the opinion in the media and academia, and there is much less ostracizing and silencing of different opinions. And overall, the Overton window of what is acceptable to be said in the public discourse is dramatically different and broader than in, let's say, Germany or Sweden. There is also much less appreciation for the, in the Western countries, broadly accepted discourse of anti-Western interpretations of history that are completely lacking any historical contextual nuances and just interpret the history of the world as a never-ending oppression of non-Western and non-white peoples by the evil, racist European colonizers. This worldview is always stupid, but it starts to be blatant when it's applied in a country like Sweden without significant history of colonialism. And it becomes completely ridiculous when applied in a countries like the Czech Republic or Poland that were basically colonized themselves and were seen racially inferior a lifetime ago. Such views of history are thus clearly rejected by the majority of people in the region. I wrote in the beginning about the incident during the football match between Slavia Prague and the Glasgow Rangers. It was part of a broader discussion about racism in the Czech Republic since the previous fall was heavily influenced by George Floyd protests in the USA. The whole thing was of course heavily debated and medialized in Europe and everybody needed to have an opinion. A lot of people were initially quite understanding of the protests since the murder itself was quite clearly an example of unnecessary police brutality but started to be very skeptical when statues of historical figures were taken down and vandalized and when football teams in the European matches were kneeling before the kickoff to pay their respects. Most people find it hard to understand why would a Czech and Scottish, both countries with very little numbers of people of African descent, football teams kneel before their matches because of a murder that happened on a different continent almost a year ago. During the George Floyd protests, when the takedowns of statues became fashionable in the West, some far-left activists spread a writing that said Winston Churchill was a racist. Black Lives Matter on a statue of Winston Churchill in Prague that was almost universally seen as a piece of exquisite stupidity and ridiculous attempt to copycat anything that the Western far left does. There is a quote by the Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban that I once read and it went somehow like this. There is not written anywhere in the great book of life that there have to be Hungarians. It is only written in our hearts. Whatever you think about Viktor Orban, that is a pretty powerful quote that also very accurately illustrates the sentiment of the peoples in the region. The fact that these nations have their independent states is not carved in stone for eternal times. It is often a result of the will of the people in combination with favorable geopolitical conditions of the time, like the World War I or fall of the Iron Curtain. States have to try to influence their internal and external environments to prolong the circumstances that allow these nations to hold on to the patch of land that they call home. In the 1990s and the 2000s, the admission into the Western military and political structures was the paramount goal of these nation states. There was a clear path of emulating the political and economic structures of the Western European countries, since there was no other alternative to the Western model, which was both culturally allied and also the most successful in the world. But as the time went by, several trends collided to change the status quo. The Western European countries and first and foremost Germany, that wields biggest influence within the EU, became more adherent to the Vogue cultural norms and also more preachy towards post-communist states. At the same time, the Central and Eastern European countries' economies grew significantly, and as the countries became richer, their populations also became more politically self-confident. These two trends then inevitably collided onto the right external influences. The most important milestones were the 2014 annexation of Crimea, the 2015 immigrant crisis, implementation of the Green New Deal for the EU since 2020, and the Russian invasion of Ukraine in 2022. All this was happening while the Western European economic model was looking increasingly less competitive on the world scale in comparison with the United States or the East Asian countries. This fact also significantly influenced the meaning of many people that it is no longer necessary to just blindly follow the leadership of Western European countries. The very ambivalent results of the immigration crisis or the straight-up catastrophic results of the Energiewende, which is the German energetic policy based on renewables and Russian gas, 
persuaded many people that while often being looked down upon and not really taken seriously, they can be as right as the Western Europeans are. The rejection of the wokeness, even if it still is an unresolved issue that might go different ways in different countries, is thus the product of traumatic histories of the countries in the region as well as a product of the process of cultural and political emancipation and affirmation of one's own cultural value.